Um, so I apologise for a start to some of the people in the audience have heard some versions of this before, even like last week in this very room, um, and also at ACRS, but it will be a little bit different. Uh, so what I'm going to try and do is look at whether we've had any success in managing terrestrial runoff to the Great Barrier Reef, um, put that in the context of the state of the Great Barrier Reef and see how they interact, and then go on to talk about our total failure to manage some other big water quality issues facing the Great Barrier Reef. Um, you all know that long ago, a couple of hundred years ago, the uh, Great Barrier Reef catchment, which we see here, um, was well forested green, the colour there, um, but now much of the vegetation cover's gone, and, um, ch or changed rather, and uh, that's been replaced by rangeland grazing, that buff colour, sugarcane along the coast, grain cropping and cotton cropping down here, horticulture, which you can't see at this scale, urban areas, which you can't see at this scale, and coal mining now, which you actually can see at this scale nowadays. It's got so big, but I haven't put it on there. Uh, we need to do that sometime to actually see the massive area of coal mining that is now happening. Uh, of course, those changes have led to huge changes in the uh, runoff of various materials to the Great Barrier Reef, maybe five times as much sediment, six times as much nitrogen, nine times as much phosphorus, and infinitely more pesticides, of course, since there wasn't any there 200 years ago, but quite large loads in measured in tonnes of certain pesticides run off into the Great Barrier Reef, mainly from the southern part here, hence the big red arrows and not so much up in the far north. Um, Right, so we've been trying to manage some of that for a while, haven't we? We had a Marine Park Act back in 1975, a Marine Park Authority. We've had research institutions. We had zoning. We had plans of management in the Great Barrier Reef and supposed pesticide management through various federal bodies. Um, however, I guess it's my contention that for the first 20 years after 1975 or so, and perhaps longer than that, all we managed really was tourists. Um, we managed them to death, um, and uh, we didn't manage any of the other things at all. Um, one of the things we should have, perhaps should have been managing was water quality, of course, but we were doing some research a very long time ago when we had consensus statements, we had water quality action plans. We did manage sewerage on resort islands out in the Great Barrier Reef because we had the power to do that in the early 90s. Um, finally, we did get together a reef plan to manage water quality in the Great Barrier Reef by about 2003, so you'll see that's about 25 years to get there. Um, that wasn't really a plan to do anything, it was a plan to have a plan, and it took us another five years to, through various other activities like water quality improvement plans, to finally get to a, um, following another consensus statement, to a reef plan 2009, which was where we really got to actually have plans to do something. Uh, those plans were funded in 2008 through a program called Reef Rescue, $200 million over five years, which has just finished, of course. Um, Queensland also had some actions about regulation, um, but they've sort of gone away with the new Queensland government, perhaps. Um, perhaps a good idea, they didn't work anyway. Um, we've now got of course got to further consensus statement, just came out again, and we have a new ver version of brief plan going forward for the next five years. It took us 30 years to get from science to something that we could get politicians to actually do on the ground, a very long process. Um, however, it's been successful, recently successful. Um, over the last couple of, first couple of years of the reef rescue program, total nitrogen discharges are down by 7%, suspended sediment by 6%, that amounts to about that much in tonnes, important number I'll bring up again later, and herbicides are down by 15%, one part of the pesticide load, so that's good news, so we have, and these are reported in public report cards, that we are making a difference, albeit somewhat small yet, but remember this program's now going on, so we hope to continue 
those gains beyond 2011, and uh, these are modelled, and the model gains beyond 2011 are being worked on now, and we'll know about them in the next year or so. And now we've got some more good news. Reef Rescue 2, another $200 million is funded for the next five years, and uh, in the end, both the coalition, the Labor government committed to this, but the coalition government's committed this, to this as well, and so we can look forward to that actually happening, and it's starting already. I'll be in Bundaberg next week to start planning how we're going to spend that money. <laughs> However, <laughs> we don't have any coral, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is a bit of a problem. <laughs> um, coral cover used to be, and this is a bit tricky, these are pretty lumpy figures back in the 1960s, but... Uh, we think coral cover on, living coral cover on the Great Barrier Reef was up around 50%. Um, and of course, at the start of the long-term monitoring program, this is mainly for mid-shelf reefs I'm talking, I'll talk about inner shelf reefs in a moment. You might have seen some of this from Jamie Oliver. Yesterday, it was 28% and a paper written by Hugh Sweetman, 22%. And now, of course, the paper that came out last year, 14%. Remembering that 14% is broken up with, uh, into two areas. And south of Cooktown, that number's 11%, because it's averaged out with better coral cover north of Cooktown. And, of course, it's still going down. We're not going anywhere upwards right at the moment. And uh, the, if you look at the predictions, we're going towards 5% sometime soon. Um, so not a good story there. And, of course, you've seen all this before. The one place where it appears to be relative stable life is on Cape York. <laughs> Um, inshore reefs, and this data is not all published yet, but Jamie might have shown some of it yesterday, I'm sure. Uh, we have the long term, the, sorry, the marine monitoring program, which only goes back about seven years, and uh, it doesn't tell a particularly better story for inshore reefs, and it says, shows a particularly nasty story for ju juvenile corals as well, the, the, uh, and the possibility of recovery, although things have been looking a bit better lately here too, with, with some unpublished data since all the extreme weather's gone away for at least for one year. Uh, seagrass isn't good either, is it really? We've lost, this is uh, different sorts of seagrass, reef seagrass, subtitle, coastal nesterine. Uh, there's some tiny little bumps at the end here. You'll see the trends are down. These have been under chronic stress for many years, decades, but the acute stresses of the floods and the... Uh, big cyclones in the last five years or so have really knocked them to bits. Um, and overall, and this came out in a paper we published, um, as we said, the corals going down, dugong populations in the central and southern GBR are most more or less gone altogether, if you can forget about them. There's still good ones in Harvey Bay and in Cape York and Torres Strait, not bad. Um, Seagrass is in trouble, sharks and other. We've got crown of thorns again, of course, started off uh, Cairns to Cooktown area as predicted by Katerina Fabricius and I and so on some years ago that that would happen again in, in about 2009, of course it did, um, and we can expect to see them marching down the reef while well, floating down, the larvae floating down the reef for the next few years. Um, we've got increasing inshore turbidity, we've really finally published papers that show that increased sediment loads from rivers does cause increased turbidity, settling that argument we've had with people like uh, Peter Ridd and uh, Piers Larkham for the last 30 years or so, or maybe 20 years. Um, and of course we've got increased incidence of coral disease associated with both water quality and temperature increases and a whole lot of other things, and fishing lines apparently, interestingly, and water temperatures and calcification, as you've heard about. <laughs> so we put together the new consensus statement. I think just read this part here, GBR ecosystems declining trend in condition due to continuing poor water quality and the cumulative impacts of climate change and increasing intensity of extreme events. Uh, the water quality part of that is associated still mainly with agriculture runoff but we have got a little bit of good news right at the end here. We do know about practices that can improve water quality in farming, and we're starting to apply them. 
Um, just a bit about the big flows. These are river flows from the Normanby River in the north to the Burnett in the south. Um, I've only tacked on the last bit here, which is this year. But we've had an area here in the southern Great Barrier Reef over the last seven or eight years where we've had just massive flows. The red numbers mean more than three times the mean annual flow in that year and so on for the two times, I think, or whatever, and the yellow a bit between one and two times. Um, and this is really what's caused that a massive loss of seagrass and so on. We've got d fresh, dirty, um, full of pesticides and everything else, water coming out, covering up the seagrass, and seagrass doesn't like that, and the dugongs die later from starvation, as do green turtles to some extent. We also had massive cyclones, of course, um, and you've all seen this in the past, the patterns of the category four and five cyclones in recent times. Remember, of course, major cyclones, big cyclones don't cause all the rain, small cyclones do that. There's a misconception that somehow still around that Yasi caused the floods in Brisbane and Rockhampton. Sorry, Yasi was a month after that. It was Cyclone Tasha, which you probably haven't heard of, of course, all those floods down the coast in 2011. Um, and I've talked about that, dugong mortality. Crown of thorns again, I'll just talk about this a little bit. Um, I think we know, you know, there's still some arguments about this, but we're fairly convinced that extra nutrient discharge from the land, whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus, might be another uh, question, not answered yet properly, um, but that there's a link between nutrient discharge and increased frequency of crown of thorns outbreaks. Um, it's... Uh, there may be a role for top-down as well. We haven't ruled that out in any way, but um, certainly this is probably the bigger, bigger reason, I guess. But that this one may... Um, and this, by this... The, the no-take zones having less cots from that Sweetman paper, that may not really be the case anymore. Further data's not really continuing to support that. Uh, it's a large cause of mortality, and now it's started again, and we can expect high mortality from crown of thorns. <laughs> so why didn't we manage water quality and all these other things that counted long ago? Well, um, we started managing fishing properly, really, with uh, the rezoning in 2004 that affected both trawling and line fishing. Uh, reef plan sort of got up in 2008 through reef rescue. Uh, climate change management, we'll forget about that. And since, of course, for the last 18 months there's been no climate change in Queensland and for the last month probably not in Australia as well. Um, so we don't have to worry about that one. And pesticide management, we have a really, really atrocious pesticide management regime in Australia that's totally ineffective and you can expect nothing better from that. We're lucky in the Great Barrier Reef we have money and time to actually work with farmers to manage pesticides. Anywhere else in Australia, that doesn't happen. So, you know, we have obviously failed in our management responsibilities for the Great Barrier Reef. Um, why? Well, I think some of these reasons that I talked about last year as well. We managed tourists pretty good, but that wasn't the issue. Fisheries very recently... Um, terrestrial runoff recently, pesticide management still not very well, uh, climate change not at all, and now, of course, we have massive coastal development going on, and there's no way one could ever say that's been managed particularly well, and Gladstone surely the uh, wonderful example of how not to do it. Um, all this takes a long time, and I just wanted to make that point there again, to get to consensus, to get politicians to act, um, takes a long time, and you need special people again, leaders. We were talking about leaders before. The one person who got water quality management up, in reality, there was all people like me and so on fiddling around in the background, but was Robert Hill, the Liberal Minister for the Environment, who did that in Cairns in one day in 2001. He said, do it, and we did it. <laughs> Took a while to get going, but he did it. It was one person, Robert Hill. And that's really alarming, isn't it? It takes one person to make things happen. And if he wasn't there, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> um, let's go on to talk about where our current failures are now in water quality management. We've got po huge port expansions planned up and down the coast, some new ports here as well I won't go into, 
some up right up on Cape York and a couple down near there. One of those is now off the table, but um, let's just think how much dredge spoil. We've been trying to put these numbers together for a while. Some of you will have heard me talk about it at ACRS and other places. How much dredge spoil is about to be dumped in the Great Barrier Reef Oil Heritage Area? Well, our best estimates, 150 million tonnes of almost certainly over the next decade, could be as high as 200, but some of the proposals might go ahead. Let's compare that to what comes out of rivers. About 9 million tonnes comes out per year out of all the rivers. About 6 million tonnes of that's anthropogenic. The other three is natural sediment delivery. Um, if you divide 150 by 10 or so, you get a large number that's much bigger than the total anthropogenic sediment discharge to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and the, remember the amount I talked about that we've saved through reef rescue is 360,000 tonnes by spending about $100 million. Um, this is enormously alar alarming, particularly alarming really though, it could be managed. We managed it 20 years ago in Townsville very successfully, I believe. Um, however, our government's arrangement now are inadequate and corrupt, basically. And I mean the process is corrupt. I don't mean the people are corrupt, but the process is corrupt. And you all know what that's about. I won't even explain it. You can ask me if you like. And we put out some papers describing how that could be done better. <laughs> um, but at the moment, it's not. And here's some spoil amounts, if you can, at, at all the amounts of ten cubic metres into tonnes and the probability of it going ahead, some of it's underway already in Gladstone and the others are still highly likely to actually go ahead. Um, so what's the future hold for the Great Barrier Reef with respect to water quality management and the thing? Well, it's not good, is it, really? We're having, you've heard about this, we're having increased rainfall intensity. We think that's really happening already. If, and more frequent flooding, therefore, and more intense cyclones. Not more cyclones, but more intense ones, and other, other, the other obvious things going on. Um, and so I guess my conclusion really is, is that uh, in the face of more crown of thorns starfish and bleaching and extreme weather, increasing coastal development, it's not good, but we can keep doing some things. And so terrestrial runoff management, which I hope to spend at least another year or two helping to do, we can do it. We can enforce the zoning. Starting to have some effects on something other than fish now, so I hear on coral disease through um, a lack of coral disease in green areas where there's less fishing line damage to the coral, quite wonderful. Um, and of course, this one here would be nice to do something about as well, a much harder task though, given the huge about billions and billions of dollars involved in coal and coal seam gas export. <laughs> and I might finish there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.